So let's go through every single army and faction in Warhammer 40k, ranked by roughly how well they're performing in games at the moment. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking 40k army win rates and tournament stats, talking through every faction in the game, roughly how well they're doing in tournaments and big events, and some of the units and choices that are commonly being used with some good success. I thought it was well worth updating this video from the last one, given that since 10th editions come out, we've had an enormous amount of changes, particularly the huge points and rules updates that we had in the last balanced data slate, which flipped things around hugely for a lot of factions out there in the game, some of the strongest becoming the weakest, and vice versa. For this video, I thought we'd take a look through primarily looking at tournament win rates. Obviously, these don't give the absolute entire picture. It can be skewed by the types of players that play certain factions, the sample size of some armies, and in reality, each army tends to have its own win rates against each other, and some counter each other quite well, but in general I think it is really quite a helpful rough and ready metric for overall army strength in the game at the moment. Besides that, I thought it would be interesting to see how regularly played each army is, and how many big tournament wins they've been taking home since the balance data slate, the latter maybe helping underline which armies really do best at the absolute top level of play. Overall though, just for the raw numbers, 40k balance does seem to be doing enormously better than it was at the start of 10th. Early on we had armies dropping with win rates low as 30%, and some up to the high 60s, and things have massively massively improved since then, most armies now being within Games Workshop's theoretical target of 45-55% to wins. In any case though, let's jump straight into it, and talk through each army in the game, starting with the weakest, and moving towards the strongest. First up in 10th edition, it looks like these armies are perhaps the ones that are struggling the most in game right now. These all have a win rate of 45% or below at tournaments, and might be being played at tournaments a little bit less than they would have otherwise been as a result. Looks like the lowest win rates in 40k at the moment are around about 39 or 40%, though even this seems to be rather massively improved since the around about 30% or so that we had before the data slate. As we go along, we'll start by putting the armies on a big graph, just for a handy visual representation of rough army power in 40k right now. Focusing on these weaker factions to start with though, it seems that arguably Blood Angels might be one of the weakest factions in the game currently. A tournament win rate of 39% overall, again seemingly a little bit better in the Gladius detachment rather than with their own detachment. Looks like their win percentage is unchanged since I last made the version of this video, though they have managed to take home at least one grand tournament since that time. As armies go in 40k, they're one of the slightly more niche ones out there, 20th most played in tournaments out of 26, though out of the divergent chapters, both Space Wolves and Death Watch are played a bit less. For their faction rules, they gain Oath of Moment, which is going to be taking a big nerf with the Space Marine Codex recently, which probably won't help them out too much. And then if they take their Sons of Sanguinius detachment, then they get the plus one strength and plus one attack on the charge. Definitely makes melee a bit more threatening, though it seems that people have more success with Gladius delivering things to melee a bit easier. For standout units in their index, I feel like Death Company are kind of okay with Power Fist and Inferno pistols. They are fairly intimidating with the amount of damage they can do, and particularly with Lamartis to lead them. The Librarian Dreadnought can teleport units around, which is quite nice for delivering firepower forces. Bar Predators can threaten some good Overwatch, and in general Sanguinary Priests and Dante maybe joining some Assault Marines has been popular in the past. I guess we're still waiting on an FAQ at the moment to allow those to join the Jump Intercessors. Overall though, seems that things aren't coming together for the Sons of Sanguinius. Their staple Sanguinary Guard are still a bit overcosted, really, and having a unique detachment that generally performs worse than the Gladius means that no real strength at tournaments and things is coming from there. It is kind of interesting to see a Divergent chapter doing so much worse than core Space Marines though, particularly given that they've got access to almost every option that the standard Space Marines have, barring things like special characters. Overall though, it seems that Blood Angels might be one of the factions that need the most help from Games Workshop at the next balance update, though I guess at the moment we've yet to see how they'll interact with the new Codex Space Marines. In general, the better formations there do seem to be a bit more firepower than assault focused though. Next up, and again seemingly one of the weakest factions in 40k right now, are Drukhari, a tournament win rate of 40%, which is pretty similar to what it was before the data slate. They have managed to win one tournament, with someone running a bunch of land spam plus some pain engines, and in general they do tend to be a niche faction, perhaps unsurprisingly with such dismal performance they are holding steady at one of the least played factions in 40k, 24th most played or 3rd lowest. Their army rule is power from pain, allowing them to trade slain units and fail Battleshock into big rerolls for the damage dealers of their army. And real space raiders maybe just is a little bit underwhelming, only giving you a few more pain tokens towards that total depending on HQs taken. It does have a few fun stratagems though, a minus one to wound for covens, some bonus pain tokens and strike and fade. 
I feel like they might still perhaps be in a position where their assault units haven't quite recovered from losing army-wide advance and charge the entire time in 9th edition though. Currently, competitive Drukhari lists seem to build very, very heavily into land spam. Lots of Ravagers, maybe some Raiders with Cabalites in, perhaps some Void Raven bombers. And Scourges are really quite nice with their jump, shoot, jump, and again, more lance fire. Otherwise, I feel like Leoth Hesperax and the Archon are fairly good HQs, and the Kronos is very tough for the cost, though maybe doesn't do much damage. Seems that the points changes weren't quite enough to help them out here. A fair bunch of lesser played stuff did go down, but it doesn't seem to have been enough to compensate for Ravagers going up a little bit as one of the best units in the Codex. Overall, definitely looks like they could use a boost at the next data slate, either points cuts or maybe a rules boost to make their detachment rule a bit stronger, perhaps. Also on the lower end of the power spectrum, we've got the Adeptus Custodes. These guys had a fairly monumental fall from the top spots, dropping down from a win rate in the upper 50s down to 43%, and that's translated to no big event wins since the data slate, despite being a pretty popular faction still. Ninth most played in tournaments at the moment. To be fair, they weren't really winning that many tournaments before the data slate either. Armies like custodies that often rely on stat checking the opponent might do a bit better in casual games or smaller tournaments in general. Their army rule is the Martial Guitar, giving their choice of melee buffs in the fight phase. They do tend to be a very combat-heavy army. And their detachment rule, the Ages of the Emperor, gives them a 4-plus save against mortal wounds. Definitely helpful, but much, much less so after the balanced data slate, given that it no longer works on devastating wounds anymore. Otherwise, they do have very powerful stratagems, fights first, resurrecting a custodian, and damage buffs against monsters, among others. But again, I think they got hit particularly hard from the balanced data slates and the change to free battle tactic stratagems, as now you're actually going to need to pay the 2 CP cost for fighting first with a big unit, and can't just rely on a shield captain to get you that for free. Custodies don't have the absolute biggest unit pool in the world. It seems that a lot of army lists are still built around Custodian Guard, Alarus and Wardens of various sorts, often led by Blade Champions or Trajan Valoris, and maybe a few Caladius tanks in the backfield for some efficient anti-tank from Forge World. It seems though between the smaller unit sizes and the points increases and stratagem flips that the majority of armies aren't really getting stat checked quite as easily by the custodies anymore. Perhaps Games Workshop came down a little bit too harshly on them and seems to have pushed them to the other end of the power spectrum. As they're below 45% wins though, could be fairly positive figure them getting some sort of buff or reversal of nerfs in the next data slate. Some sort of middle ground between early 10th and now. Grey Knights were one of the armies that were struggling the most previously, and it seems that despite some really quite heavy points buffs to the faction, they haven't really been able to move all that much. Their win rate of 43% is solidly better than it used to be, but still certainly on the lower side of Warhammer 40k in general, they've not won any very big events since the data slate, and they're sort of a lower mid popularity army, 16th most played of 26. Grey Knights are the army that uses their teleport assault to basically redeploy units at the end of each turn. Units jump back into strategic reserve and get to deep strike again back in your turn, basically meaning that they can always be threatening different areas of the table, though sometimes perhaps not always all that reliably, as they tend to do better damage in combat rather than range, and anything deep striking might be gambling on a 9-inch charge. The detachment rule I think is maybe a bit underwhelming, and perhaps a bit redundant given the teleporting. Teleport shunt allows you to advance 6 inches, Kind of handy for Dread Knights with their special rules, but not very good for most other things unless you're burning CP to advance and shoot. Otherwise, Mists of Diamos is a powerful rule to allow Grey Knights to return to reserve if the enemy moves too close. Can be quite big for keeping a massive unit safe. And the Sigil of Exigence remains really quite powerful to teleport away when shot. For more standout units, they generally tend to build quite heavily around Terminators and Paladins, backed up by their cast of characters. Maybe Librarians for Vortex of Doom and Caldor Drago for delivering at least one fairly powerful and very reliable charge for quite cheap. Purifiers with Castell and Crow are now really quite efficient with the big points cuts. The Grandmaster Dread Knight is one of the few units that can really put the smack down on monsters and vehicles well, though I do feel that even with their points cuts, they're still a little bit low on the damage output side of things, and really rely on teleport tricks to hit the enemy where they're weakest, and they still struggle to deal with monsters and vehicles for the most part. Overall, they've definitely been helped out a bit, maybe not too far from where they need to be. Could probably do with just being a little bit more dangerous and hard to ignore in combat for how elite they are. Moving upward slightly to the 45% win armies, Imperial Knights seem to have echoed the story of Custodes, being a pretty strong army with a high 50s win percent, but then very harsh nerfs seem to have kicked them down to a level that's thoroughly mediocre. From the first tournament results after the data slate, it looked like they were holding their own with Chaos Knights, but now that a few more games have been played, the Chaos Knights do seem to be fairly significantly ahead. 
they have still managed to win one big tournament since the data slate update and remain a fairly popular faction around about middling for 40k at 12th out of 26 and as with custodies they tend to be an army that tends to do better in more casual metas in smaller three round tournaments or when you're just playing games with friends. Their army rule is the Code Chivalric, giving you some nice damage re-rolls and three command points if you manage to slay the enemy warlord, which can happen from time to time. And their Agent of the Emperor adds some raw extra defense, a 6 plus feel no pain type save, going to a 5 plus if they happen to get honors. Both of those rules plus powerful data sheets initially had them fairly dominant at the start of 10th edition, though it seems that the other points and rules changes are now put them in a place where it's no longer enough to carry them. For the big changes out of the data slate, the Bondsman abilities now only affect Armagers, which was kind of disastrous for a lot of units. Things like Crusaders no longer hitting on 2s and Wardens no longer with minus 1 damage were really quite big changes, and that was a heavy nerf to some of the best models in the book. A couple of their better stratagems increased in cost as well, 2 CP for fights on death or plus 1 to wounds, they can't overwatch anymore, Canis's free stratagems got toned down, and Armagers going up in points to 150 points each was fairly brutal for them as well. At the moment it feels like knights are actually quite well internally balanced, even if they're a little bit weak versus the field. I have seen lists that take some very very different combinations of units and still seem to be doing okay with them. Perhaps some of the most common staples are Canis Rex and at least some Armagers. Perhaps Warglaives a little bit more commonly so than Helverins. Then likely with at least one other big knight in the mix somehow, either Crusaders, Wardens, Lancers or Castellans all seem kind of interesting. But not quite as exciting for the points as they used to be maybe. In general it is a good idea to take some Imperial Agents along, either henchmen, warbands or assassins for a little bit of support with secondaries. Overall though, certainly seem to have changed to an army where you really need to work for your victories now, and can't generally just stat check enemies with sheer amounts of damage and defence. Again like the Custodies though, given that they're struggling a little bit more than most factions now, it might be possible that Games Workshop decide to reverse some of those nerfs when the next balance slate comes round, and try and get them a bit more middling. Finally for this lower end of the 40k power spectrum are the Astra Militarum. The Imperial Guard do seem to have improved a little bit from their previous data slate state. They're now up to 45% wins, have won a couple of big events since the data slate, and they remain really quite popular in 40k as ever really. 7th most commonly played at tournaments. That number does seem to have gone up a little bit. Maybe people are a little bit more excited to put Rosses back on the table again. For their core rules they get orders. Plus 3 inch to move 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 is always handy. Plus 1 to hit and plus 1 to the saves are all great. Born Soldiers gives them lethal hits if they're static. Handy enough if you can remain stationary for a turn, but that's often not possible in 40k. Generally it's perhaps most helpful to their fairly good artillery. And out of their index rules, perhaps the most standout stratagem is reinforcements to respawn a big load of units. Grand strategies can be quite nice for a tank commander as well. And they do have several stacking buffs to damage, which could be quite helpful with Ursula Creed getting fields of fire for free. For some standout units, often Lord Solar and maybe Ursula Creed are often seen leading lists. Lord Solar in particular is pretty amazing, farming command points and giving you some of the best orders out there. Gaunt Ghosts are very commonly played as an annoying unit of lone operatives for secondary objectives and maybe occasionally bullying enemy infantry. And otherwise for more mainline damage dealer threats, a few Ross variants like Demolishers, Exterminators and Executioners seem to get played quite a bit, as does the Rogal Dawn. Basilisks and Manticores are both pretty reasonable for a bit of artillery fire support despite the nerfs, and there's plenty of okay options for taking the midfield, Death Corps of Krieg infantry with feel no pain type saves and respawning are quite nice, and Scout Sentinels are really quite cheap and tough for what they do, even given the points increase. Overall I feel like again maybe the Codex internal balance isn't really all that bad, and maybe just a tiny bit underpowered as a whole. Guard units can be a little bit slow and ponderous unless they're using move move move, and not many invulnerable saves can often mean infantry and tanks die in droves quite easily. Perhaps just need a little bit of extra damage and defence to really help them threaten the top dogs. Moving onwards and upwards, here are the armies that are made as perhaps lower mid factions in Warhammer 40k right now. By the numbers, the first three of these not really significantly higher than the last ones. Space Marines, Necrons and Space Wolves all at 46%, and then Admech, Death Guard and Sisters of Battle all up at 48 These ones are just inside Games Workshop's theoretical targets of 45 to 55%. Though I feel like a few of the armies here definitely have some issues, and plenty of iconic units in their indexes that are kind of underwhelming. Putting them onto the overall graph, this is roughly what we'd be looking at, maybe approaching the middle of the distribution a bit where there's quite a lot of armies that are kind of close together. First up, and perhaps the numbers may be a little bit redundant already here, are the Space Marines. These ones are the pre-codex numbers, given that we don't have any meaningful tournament data yet of how their codex numbers are coming out. It will definitely be interesting to take a look at some top army lists and which formations are doing better though when they are. 
The Space Marine win rate seems to be sitting at 46%. They've only won one big tournament since the data slates, though that doesn't include all the Divergent chapters, which have done a bit better. Though being basically the poster boys of 40k, they do remain one of the most popular played factions in tournaments, fourth most played overall, though that will go up to easily first if you included things like Black Templars, Dark Angels and Blood Angels all under Space Marines. Their army rule is Oath of Moment, selecting one enemy target for big rerolls against them. Previously it was all hit rolls to hit and wound, that's just going to be going down to rerolls to hit. That's going to be quite a big nerf to the faction, particularly for mid-strength firepower and things with devastating wounds. For these numbers, they'll all be with the Gladius Detachment, so the various doctrines where you get to advance, fall back and still damage, and then nice options to flex between them for 1 CP, and a few other helpful things like Lance Melee and Squad Tactics and things. Going forward though, there's going to be a lot more options. I feel like the Firestorm Assault Force and the Ironstorm Spearhead look perhaps particularly nice just for raw power. I'd guess that those two at least will compete pretty nicely with the Gladius, maybe the Vanguard one as well with big infiltrating blocks of scary damage dealers. From the Gladius itself though, the Fire Discipline Enhancement is particularly popular, often paired with an Apothecary Biologist and Aggressors for some brutal auto wounds on the enemy. It works quite well with Lieutenants and things like Hellblasters too. For how things are shaping up with a new book, Space Marines of course have an absolute ton of options and now lots of ways to play. They've got really quite nice infiltration options with scouts, infiltrators and eliminators all being good in their own way. Some pretty solid anti-tank platforms with things like the Gladiator Lancer, Ballistas Dreadnought and Repulsor Executioner. The standard Repulsor is a pretty powerful transport and the Redemptor Dreadnought with its 2 plus save and minus 1 damage is fairly indomitable for 200 points. For foot troops, Hellblasters and Eradicators do okay on the damage dealing front. Blade Guard Aggressors and Terminators are all quite nice for more melee units led by powerful fighting characters. And perhaps on the character side of things, I feel like the Tech Marines are particularly stand out. Lieutenants and Captains are often pretty handy depending on the unit and the formation that you're running though. Overall, it's going to be interesting to see how Space Marines do from here. I feel like the loss of the big O3 rolls is probably going to impact their power a bit. It will be interesting to see if things like Firestorm or Ironstorm can compensate for that. Moving on, we've got the Living Metal Warriors of the Necrons. They're winning around about 46% of tournament games at the moment, a little bit reduced on previously. They still seem to be very popular when being taken to tournaments, the second most played faction in the meta at the moment, and that's led them to four big event wins. It does seem though that when you account for the numbers of players, that those event wins are actually just more proportionate to the amount of people that are taking them. They are just a very popular faction in 40k, given being such a big focus in 9th edition. For their army rules, they've got reanimation protocols for repairing and reviving models in the squad, and that can be stacked really quite high with things like the reactive reanimation strat, ghost arcs, reanimators, resurrection orbs, and the warrior's own buffs. Typically, necron warriors or lich guard can often be a big durability unit to build around when backed up by a bunch of those. Command protocols gives their current index a big focus on leaders with plus one to hit for the lead units. And otherwise, for their awakened dynasty, the sovereign coronal's rather nice, maybe on a hex mark destroyer for guiding a bunch of firepower. The Hyper Material Ablator is quite a nice durability boost, and they've got some nice stratagems for re-rolling wound rolls at range, or resurrecting characters from death if they should happen to get sniped. Besides the core of their army, Cryptex can be quite nice to add some durability boost to units. Cryptothals I think are still usable despite the heightened points cost. The Transcendent Katarn with the Sempaternal Weave is still monstrously tough, and then they've got some fairly efficient firepower between Heavy Destroyers, Doomstalkers, the Doomsday Arc, and maybe the Monolith maybe with a hex mark or two floating around to provide some annoying counter-shooting. Overall, I feel like quite a lot of the Necron Codex is at least fairly viable, though the balanced data slate really did hit their core durability combo kind of hard. Lichguard and a few of their most useful support pieces going up a little bit, plus the Doomsday Arcs increasing, I think was a fairly big blow to competitive Necrons, and it's perhaps why they've dropped a bit despite a few other things going down. Overall, they do tend to be a faction that perhaps doesn't have an enormous amount of damage output as well. Next up, the Space Wolves seem to be fairly level with the standard Space Marines, 46% wins, so that's increased quite a lot from previous. Again, they're one of the chapters that tends to do better in Gladius, usually doing significantly better if they're not using their Champions of Rus 1. I haven't seen any big events that they've won since the balanced data slate, though that's probably partly because they're very low played compared with other factions in the game right now, 23rd most played overall, making them the 4th least played one. Besides Oath of Moment, if you take their Champions of Rus detachment, you get the Saga boosts, all pretty powerful bonuses, though they are just very random as to whether or not you can activate them with characters. The stratagems are also just a little bit annoying being tied to the sagas for the most part for the better value out of them, and it just makes it quite a shaky army to use compared with Gladius, though I have seen some people making it work to good effect. 
Perhaps for their most standout unit, Thunderwolf Cavalry are pretty excellent at 90 points. They've got really quite good support characters as well and hit home with damage to attacks. Most competitive lists seem to be running at least some of those. Bjorn and Murderfang are both really quite efficient dreadnoughts. Logan Grimnar for some big re-rolls on the charges is really nice. And access to Femrisian Wolves I think is handy, given they're really quite cheap and fast. Good for running around doing secondary objectives. Overall, I do feel like they've got some pretty interesting unique data sheets. It'll be interesting to see if any players embrace that new Stormlance detachment, given that that seems fairly good for Thunderwolves on paper at least. Just kind of a shame that the Champions of Ross is quite so unreliable with the Saga type mechanic. Next up, and improved really quite significantly since the edition start, are the Adeptus Mechanicus, a win rate of around 48% at tournaments, up a big 8% from the 40 that they were at previously. Still no big tournament wins, though again like the Space Wolves, it might partly be due to so few people running them. They appear to be the second least played faction at tournaments at the moment, I guess partly because they're a kind of niche army and spectacularly expensive to collect for their actual models. For their army rules, the Doctrine and Imperatives get them to choose between Heavy and Assault each turn, plus some AP buffs and debuffs. Not the worst for gunline armies, though their Rab Bombardment rule is kind of bad, very rarely having any meaningful effect in game. Apparently it's going to get rewritten for their codex. Some of their stratagems aren't too bad, they get to advance and charge on one of them, a reactive minus one to wound in the fight phase is quite nice, and a return fire stratagem is handy, but I still think they'd be argued to be one of the factions got, that has got slightly weaker supporting rules. For stronger units, the vast majority of lists seem to be building around Cataphron Breachers with their heavy arc rifles. They're one of the few units that's really quite general purpose in the Codex and seem to be the best logical choice for really quite a lot of their buffs and character support. Tech Priests often tend to hang out with them, bearing one of their fairly good shooting enhancements, particularly the Omni Sterilizer is absolutely brutal with the amount of anti-infantry devastating wounds it can put out. Otherwise, Vanguard have definitely got a lot better, given better saves and being really quite hoardy now. And quite a lot of the rest of the codex seems to be given to units that tend to be more skirmisher type units rather than primary damage dealers. I kind of feel like Admech have got more options than they really need for those between all their fast attack and cheap individual walkers and things. Overall it seems they've reached a point where their actual tournament win rate isn't doing too badly. I feel like most Admech players would probably like a bit of a rebalancing of the rules and not just be quite so heavily reliant on Cataphrons and the Omni Sterilizer to carry their damage output. Hopefully things might change around a bit in the codex for them, they'll get different detachment options and it'll be another opportunity for Games Workshop to look at the faction's points. Next we've got Mortarian's Plague Marines of the Death Guard. Again these guys are perhaps one of the single most improved factions of Warhammer 40k. Jumping up to a win rate around about 48%, so pretty middling, up from the rather dismal 35% or so that they had at the edition start. They have even managed to take down one big tournament since the data slate, something that they wouldn't have been in much danger of doing before. It does seem that the big points cuts and the new Contagion rules seem to have tempted a lot more people to play them though. They've jumped back to relatively middling player rate at tournaments from being one of the very least played armies at the start of the edition just due to how underbaked Games Workshop have made their rules. For their faction rules, the core one is the Gift of Nurgle with a minus one toughness aura, more helpful against some things than others. Though since the data slate, Games Workshop basically amplified that on their detachment rule. It still gives you the infected objectives, but now you get the choice between one of three different plagues to either say help out AP or give enemies a minus one to hit if they're nearby. Both of those could be really quite helpful depending on the opponents. Otherwise they do get quite a lot of lethal hits throughout their index, definitely helps them grind down the enemy a bit with slow attrition warfare. And one of their more standout stratagems is that nice defensive one on objectives where they can get some very big sustained hits. The points decreases that Death Guard got were rather massive, and I would say that the majority of their unique units are actually fairly interesting. Plague Marines being only 80 points means they're actually fairly threatening for the cost, if surprisingly still not really all that durable. Toughness 5 only really goes so far. They do have some good supporting characters in the very own ones like the Tallyman, Putrefier or Blightspawn. Plague Burst Crawlers are still good, perhaps directed by a Lord of Virulence. Both the Blight Haulers and perhaps particularly the Bloat Drones are also very nice too. Death Shroud I think remain one of the best damage dealers out of the Codex, taking a really big drop and perhaps being nice to deliver with rapid ingress with some of their other powerful Terminator characters. Typhus and Poxwalkers is really quite cheap and effective for their points cost, and Mortarian still maybe doesn't have the most amount of damage for his big points cost, but is still very tough and quite a good rotten core of the army. They definitely still have weaknesses, quite a lot of their datasheet rules just aren't really particularly impactful, and for the individual models they're still not enormously tough compared with their discussionally resilient days. At least they are quite cheap though, so you do get quite a lot of bodies for the points. The Sisters of Battle have also risen up a fair bit given the points changes. They're also on 48% wins overall, so fairly middling as 40k goes. 
They've won the one big tournament in 40k since the Data Slate update, which I talked about on the channel the other day. They're still a rarely played faction, though often tend to be rarely, perhaps slightly more expensive to collect and not quite as mainstream as some of them. And I feel like they've had a very rocky start to 10th edition and still very much aren't perceived as a particularly good faction, even though their tournament win rates are creeping north a bit. Their army rule is acts of faith to generate miracle dice and then sub them into big damage dealing rolls. Can be very nice for some auto wounds with multi melters or big six damage results. Lots of fairly interesting things that you can do with that. I would say their detachment rule, the Blood of Martyrs, is perhaps a bit more niche. This one's the damage buff for injured units. It is going to take effect from time to time, though it's just a bit scattergun, and your opponent can counter it just by wiping out entire squads if they care. Otherwise, for strats and enhancements and things, the resurrected character one's quite fun, and the plus one to wound on a charge if you're using melee units. After the points updates, I feel like the better units list has perhaps shifted around a bit. Seraphim with hand flamers are pretty excellent for secondaries, or maybe even threatening Overwatch and clearing out troops. More than Val, the Triumph of St. Catherine and St. Celestine are all very efficient special characters. Arco Flagellants, maybe in Rhinos, can put out a spectacular amount of blending attacks. You'd usually want at least some of the standard Sister of Battle squads to farm up some Miracle Dice, and they can be a good target to put the Miracle Dice through a multi melter as well, or certain combos like the Palatine. Castigators, Immolators and Exorcists are all playable. The Palatine is a common pick with the Blade of St. Eleanor making her surprisingly punchy. And they do have access to some fairly nice little interference units as well. Small two-man squads of Crusaders or Death Cult Assassins. Overall, I think it adds up to an army that can actually score quite well in big tournaments. They might struggle for raw damage and particularly taking down very big tough enemy units. There's just not a lot that kills tanks or heavies that well. Aside from multi melters that need to get very close and often need to rely on other mechanics to actually make them wound effectively or fall back on miracle dice. I feel like Sisters players might like a few more of their melee units to be a bit more effective and devastating in combat. Besides Arco Flagellants and maybe some Paragon Warsuits, they don't seem to be taken quite as commonly these days. Moving on, we come to the other armies that are at 50% wins or less. I perhaps consider these the upper mid tier of Warhammer 40k and generally in a fairly good spot. Strong enough to threaten the top dogs, and they do seem to win tournaments. Maybe not so strong that they're in direct lines for nerfs, though as ever, a few of them could use help with some of the units that are a bit more underwhelming for the faction. Putting them onto the big graph, they fill out the upper end of the armies in grey. Everything in green is over 50%. First up on 49% wins are the Tyranids. Perhaps kind of surprisingly unchanged in any major way since their power rating before the Codex came out. Since then they gained a whole load of different detachment options and had a bunch of points shifted, but it looks like overall the Nids are more or less remaining steady. A little bit above average in 40k tournaments, though very very popular as a faction with all the excitement in 10th edition, the third most played overall. They have managed to win two big tournaments since the balanced data slate came out. For their army rules, they get Synapse and Shadow in the Warp, slightly better morale when they're near their Synapse creatures, and also army-wide battle shot once per game for the foes. The Shadow rule I think is okay, but maybe a little bit scattergun. Occasionally it could have some good effects, occasionally it could do absolutely nothing. For the detachments, there do seem to be some definite winners and losers out of the new codex. The most commonly played and doing best in tournaments tend to be the Invasion Fleet, the Vanguard Onslaught and the Synaptic Nexus. The Unending Swarm is kind of niche play but still seems to be doing really quite well in win rates and things, whereas the Crusher Stampede and the Assimilation Swarm are much less favoured. I feel like the Invasion Fleet is still quite a powerful option for just a generic Tyranid High Fleet though. They've got options for the 5 plus feel no pain stratagem, a few handy enhancements plus their stratagem for respawning multiple units of gaunts at a time. Otherwise for the other detachments maybe standout features are the unending swarm, recycling entire units of slain tyranid termagants and things. Gargoyles jumping on and off the board can be quite nasty with that. The synaptic nexus has a bunch of handy boosts and then really quite a powerful damage dealer stratagem with re-rolling ones to hit and wound. And the Vanguard Onslaught is maybe a bit more niche and building around the Vanguard Invaders, but they do have quite a lot of crafty tricks for them. For stronger units overall, the Death Leaper and the Neurolictors seem to be near or to include in just about any of these Tyranid forces. Very annoying and surprisingly tough lone operatives are just nice to have in 40k, never mind their other rules. For more mainline damage dealers, the Zone Thropes, Exocrines, Maliceptors and Harrispecs might be quite nice to have on the front line. A bunch of units that can perhaps a little bit more reliably deal with heavier armoured targets. Gargoyles are amazing for objectives. Termagants, maybe particularly with Spine Fists, are nice as well. And Tyranids have fairly excellent secondary support with things like Biovores and Rippers, having small units that they can just chuck where they need to to score some points. Pyrovores are quite nice for just for it being very, very cheap and very tough units. Again, not too bad for a utility role at all. Overall, I feel like Games Workshop hasn't done too bad to deliver a pretty well-balanced codex with the different attachments. 
and neither really seeming too strong or too weak. I feel like, again, they might be an army that do tend to struggle a bit against very tough units with high saves. There's not a lot that can wound toughness 10 on a 3+, plus, for example. Back to the Space Marines, and the Dark Angels have a win rate of 49, quite a big increase on last time, and for these guys, the Gladius does much, much better than their launch detachment, but they definitely feel like a chapter that could be interesting for some of the other new formations in the Codex. The Dark Angels have managed to win three big events since the data slate, and these guys are one of the more popular of the Space Marine Divergent chapters, the 15th most played at tournaments overall. That beats out the other four Divergent chapters like Blood Angels and Friends. As with the rest of Space Marines, their army rule is set to get worse with Oath of Moment, which could put a spanner in the works, and for their Unforgiven Task Force, they do have some good things. I feel like their Grim Resolve army rule, just for the one OC, even if their battle shock is kind of bad. A few of the stratagems are okay, and that Pennant of Remembrance enhancement is alright for a Deathwing Ancient, perhaps. For their more standout units, it seems to be more Deathwing than Ravenwing. Big Deathwing Night Blocks or Deathwing Terminator Command Squads are some of the most efficient Terminators around. I've seen a fair few Dark Angels army lists that don't really take much else unique besides those units. Maybe with Azrael as well, as just pretty huge value all around for just over 100 points. A really good combination of damage buffs, farming command points, the defensive buff with a Lion Helm and his own personal melee stat line. Overall seem to be in a fairly good place, mainly due to the Terminators though I feel like their Ravenwing units, for the most part, and maybe just a little bit undertuned still, could afford to probably get a little bit cheaper. Next up, we have the Gene Stiller Colt, 50% win rate overall, so minus 15 on what they were before. Certainly one of the factions that got hit the hardest by the balanced data slate points updates, but they did kind of need it, being pretty similarly dominant to Eldari. Kind of good to see, though, that despite taking a fairly heavy nerf, they've landed somewhere that's kind of still very playable, still winning a couple of big events since the data slate, though as ever they remain a very niche faction in Warhammer 40k, I think that's more just due to how they are generally though, they're well known to be one of the less played armies in the game in general. Their army rule is Cold Ambush, the chance to respawn some units once they die, previously it was very reliable, now it's a little bit shaky, and you get bonuses for battle line and being in the first two battle rounds. It's still pretty intimidating though, knowing that even if you wipe out a unit, there's a reasonable chance it might just be coming back at you in a turn or two. Otherwise, I think they've got some really quite powerful supporting rules for their guerrilla warfare. They came from below, gives them sustained hits one and ignores cover when they come in from reserve. And their stratagem to allow units to redeploy at the end of the turn, or arrive just outside of three inches at the enemy to maybe throw some demo charges along or sneak objectives or something. They do also have the potential to steal some guard data sheets as well if they want to. Could be a way to get some cheap scouting chaff infantry or something, or maybe a little bit of indirect fire. For standout units, neophyte hybrids with seismic cannons still definitely do work, combined with a Primus, maybe some Ridge Runner AP, and some other powerful damage dealing stratagems, they can still put some enormous pain on certain units. And then when they're done doing that, they're still quite a tough unit, with a whole ton of objective control to take some points. Otherwise, Acolytes with demo charges now pay more of a premium, but they can still demolish some things pretty nicely. Aberrants with the Infiltrator enhancement are very scary, first turn charges from them can be utterly brutal, and several interesting lone operatives and some scouting jackals for board control. Overall seems to be in a much better place, maybe just lapsing back a bit more into being a higher skilled army that you actually need to make advantage of all of their movement tricks to get them to win, rather than just rely on raw numbers. For the most part I'd say their weaknesses is that the majority of units just really aren't all that tough when they're on the board. They might do a bit worse against things that just have enough raw might to deal with their alpha strikes and then hit back hard. A couple of choice fast movers or deep strikers could potentially scrub their cult ambush tokens, and I feel like just having some really big swings in the army probably isn't that great for them competitively. It could be absolutely massive whether or not, say, a unit of aberrants killed early game respawns or not. Swings like that could be powerful enough to decide the game for better or worse, which probably isn't that good when it's just left to single dice rolls. Next up, we've got the Magical Machinations of the Thousand Suns, holding steady on a 50% win rate, and still doing kind of well despite taking a fairly broad battery of nerfs in the last data slate. Most of their good stuff did go up by a bit. They're kind of a middling played faction, though they do seem to be overrepresenting themselves with big tournament wins, four big first place titles taken since the data slate came out, and I think that that's genuinely quite impressive for their player rates. Their army rule is Cabal of Sorcerers, this one's really quite nice trading the Cabal points for some seriously threatening spells, and I feel like they keep them in the place that they've often been in the past, an army that you need to really pick the right one of several powerful options to be able to deliver victory. Otherwise their Kindred Sorcery buffs their psychic damage from the various sorcerers, and in general I think their supporting rules are generally quite nice, 
The enhancements are good, perhaps particularly the Umbralific Crystal to jump units round the board, and they can still turn on massive psychic damage by making combi bolters on the Scarab Occult psychic for 1 CP. Never mind the massive flexes that they can do with their Kabbalistic rituals, removing armor saves, double moving, doom bolt for loads of mortal wounds, or even just cancelling an important failed save. For the most part, I'd say the units that were strong before are still strong now, just cost a bit more points for what they do. Given their core rule, they are sort of locked into having to take quite a lot of Rupert Marines and Sorcerer units to get enough Kabbalistic ritual points to get those on the board, so quite a lot of lists tend to build around small units of rubrics with Sorcerers in them, usually with Magnus with a central focus point for big powerful stratagems and the Kabbalistic rituals, maybe a big block of Scarab Occult Terminators to be the focus of psychic damage shooting. Pretty much all of the sorcerers are generally good in their own way though, and as you might expect they tend to have a very big cast of characters in their army. Definitely an army that needs to maximise its sneaky tricks though. Generally the raw power of the data sheets just isn't enough to carry them to victory. Somewhat slow and somewhat lacking for damage outside of their massive magical might. The Chaos Demons join them and the Gene Stiller Cult on a 50% wins. Again, not really significantly changed from where they were before the data slate, even though there was a fair bit of doom and gloom when a lot of their better data sheets got nerfed. I felt like a fair few of their lesser played data sheets didn't really receive enough of a buff to catch up with the good stuff. They're kind of a middling played faction, similar to the Thousand Sons, 14th out of 26, though have only won one big event since the data slate happened. A bit less impressive than the Thousand Sons. Their army rule is the Shadow of Chaos, multiple debuffs within their area of control, either their drop zone or the midfield if you can take over half the objectives, though they do have a couple of other ways to make Shadow happen otherwise. And their detachment rule is Warp Rifts, basically allowing you to deep strike super close in the Shadow of Chaos, potentially meaning that their big cast of melee units can just get right into the enemy pretty much no questions asked. As an army they really function very differently to just about anything else in 40k, they make enemy AP worthless with their invulnerable saves, but are more vulnerable to volume fire as a result. Everything can deep strike and there's mechanisms to manipulate that with dropping in close or returning units back to the warp. And in general as an index they tend to have far far more melee than they do range, though they do have a bit of warp fire from Zinch. For the most standout units I think that Nerdlings are pretty godly board control for 35 points, both infiltrate and deep strike is pretty amazing for them and they can certainly hoover up the secondaries. Bellacore does still seem to be at the heart of most lists even with the points increase, I feel like his ability to shield the entire army from gun lines for a turn is kind of mad, plus carrying around his own personal bubble of shadow in the warp is really quite big for a lot of other options. If Bellacore is around he tends to be followed by a bunch of other greater demons, Shalaxi Hellbane with the enormous damage against tanks and vehicles, Lords of Changes and Bloodthirsters are great as well, and great unclean ones I think are actually quite good with the 4 plus feel no pain enhancement now. Otherwise flamers seem to be quite nice for skirmish type units with an actual bit of range threat, perhaps some plague bearers or horrors to hold down objectives just being really quite durable for the cost. Celesk is remarkably powerful as the Celesh demon prince combo and their lone operative choices like the changeling and blue scribes tend to get taken quite a bit, just generally handy for secondary objectives and being disruptive and hard to catch up with. Overall definitely an army that can play very differently to most of 40k and some factions might not really know what the best answer is to them. I still feel like quite a lot of the index does remain a bit on the underwhelming side, maybe the Slanesh demons in particular, but overall in their top tournament builds they still seem to be holding up okay at least. Moving on we're getting into seriously powerful stuff now, all of the next 9 armies are winning more games than they're losing, win rates above 50% and seem to be a bit stronger than the rest of the field with a variety of powerful tricks. Putting onto the graph here and we're getting into the upper echelons of 40k, we've got Death Watch, World Eaters, Chaos Knights, Tau Empire and Leagues of Votan. First up, Death Watch do seem to be doing rather well, but also seem to be the army that we've probably got the least data on out of any of them, given that they're by far the least played faction in 40k right now, and are even really quite a drop down compared with Abmech, which are the second least played. Despite such low player turnouts though, they have still managed to win one event since the balanced data slate, which is impressive, and overall the army has a win rate of 51%, despite getting some choice nerfs in the last balanced data slate. I don't think that they'll have enjoyed the desolation squads being hit quite as hard as they were, nor their special issue ammunition stratagems being locked to bolters, or their best kill teams being increased in points. I have a feeling that in the new Space Marine Codex, the Oath of Moment won't be enjoyed quite as much without the re-roll wound rolls, the devastating wounds that quite a lot of their kill teams can put out were fairly fierce, though it could still be handy for the big hit re-rolls given that they get multiple turns where they have better effects on sixes to hit, they're still going to be a faction that synergizes better than Oath with the most of them. Otherwise in their index they have multiple different shooting buffs with a special issue ammunition, unfortunately the majority of bolter platforms don't tend to be the most efficient damage dealers out there, though there are exceptions. 
They do also have some teleport tricks as well, both with stratagems and the Beacon Angelus, and the turn of Ectoclades could give you one powerful turn of shooting, singling out another enemy unit for some big re-roll death, although again it's not going to be quite as spectacular as when Oath as when Oath was re-roll wounds as well. Otherwise, the stronger units, I feel like they do tend to make quite good use of quite a lot of generic Space Marine data sheets just applied with their rules. Maybe some of the more interesting are still the standard veterans and the Proteus kill team with the sheer amount of flexibility that they have and can put out really quite a lot of heavy weapon damage with things like frag cannons, infernus heavy bolters or terminator heavy weapons which they can get three of. It'll be interesting to see how well they hold up to the Codex Space Marine changes. Maybe it could be somewhat interesting to play with the Firestorm Assault Force. At least on paper, their close range shooting units could be interesting with that one. But you would lack their damage dealing mission tactics and stratagems that can apply to multiple kill teams there. Next up, and seeming to have risen up the rankings really quite considerably for the Blood God, are the World Eaters. Their points changes in the balanced data slate might not have been super crazy big, but it does seem to have been enough to push them over the edge from being an army that was very niche to one that's genuinely quite threatening right now. In my last video on this one, they had a 41% win rate, now they're up to 51 Though at least as of yet, it doesn't seem to have translated into any big tournament wins yet. The army rule is the blessings of corn. You roll the eight dice and you pick up to two buffs for the turn. Plenty of damage dealers, a feel no pain, and maybe in particular a plus two to move and an advance and charge combo, which could see you getting into combat really quite quickly. And the detachment rule is the berserker warband with a plus one strength and attack on the charge. After the big points rebalance, I feel like the majority of their unique units are really quite viable. Corn Berserkers did feel like they were very overcosted for how much damage they did before, but now seem kind of good. You can do some very big scouting things with things like Invocators plus a ton of 8 bound or Exalted 8 bound units. Exalted 8 bound also really quite nice out of Rapid Ingress. A fight's first Master of Executions with the Berserker Glaive is a bit of a staple, and Angron himself still makes it into the majority of lists perhaps in particular forth throwing him down at the enemy, and then having a pretty reasonable chance to respawn later in the game between Berserker re-rolls on objectives, plus the enhancement that allows you to re-roll the entire Blood Tide dice pool. Even some of the Demon Engines are pretty reasonable, with things like the Lord of Skulls and the Mauler Fiends being fairly efficient support. I guess it's still fairly early days since the data slate came out, though they don't really seem to have been doing too great at big events. I guess maybe they are a little bit predictable against the very top things around, and relying almost entirely on melee maybe makes them a slightly higher skill army to play than some. Next up we've got the Chaos Knights, and last time I looked at the army win rates they seem to be fairly level with the Imperials, though it does seem that since then the Chaos Knights have pulled significantly ahead. They've got a 52% win rate, and seem to be doing very solidly better than their Loyalist cousins, are being played a little bit more at big tournaments, and have also managed to win one more event. Their Harbingers of Dread rule basically makes them Battleshock the army, a leadership debuff, translating into more damage and defence for battleshocked units on turn 3 onwards, though that is often a little bit late for swinging the outcome of a game. And Forged in Terror for their detachment rule just doubles down on that more, meaning that units that have taken any sort of damage generally need to test battleshock within 12 inches. Otherwise, for the Index, they are just a big army full of toughness 10 or better vehicles, meaning that they're good to stat check certain armies in the game. One can get a minus 1 AP enhancement, and most of their stratagems are at least fairly efficient when applies to big strong titanic things. Moving through terrain with a rampager or something is quite nice, as is just rotate iron shields for a 4 plus invulnerable. I think easy access to allied demons doesn't hurt as well for a few nurglings for random secondary objectives, or other cheaper units to hold down primaries. In general, their lists still do tend to run very war dog heavy. Not always pure war dogs, though a lot of people do tend to go that way, but they do seem to be perhaps the most efficient data sheets in the index, Carnivores in particular since their huge point drop, but also Brigands, Stalkers and Huntsmen are all pretty nice, and I rate all of their core big three knights as usable, the cheap and destructive Rampager, the big anti-tank of the Desecrator, or just the sheer damage output of the Despoiler, even if its supporting rules aren't that great. Overall it seems that they might be the power way to go as far as knights are concerned right now, they are still perhaps a bit matchup dependent, and anything that can put huge hurt on really tough targets, like maybe Eldari with all their lances can be bad news. The morale rules are always a little bit coin flippy and they often don't apply and I feel like out of their data sheets in particular the Abominant could do with a points cut. Overall though at the moment it does seem that they're doing a bit better than their Imperial cousins. Now though we're getting into the really scary stuff out there and next we have the Tau Empire which were another army that were flipped from being a very underwhelming faction into a genuinely terrifying one all through sweeping points cuts across pretty much the entirety of the army. Previously they had tournament win rates around about 37%, 
With the points cuts, they've jumped up to around 53%. They're one of the more popular played factions in 40k, 6th most overall. But even taking that into account, they do seem to be overrepresenting themselves at tournaments, taking down 5 events since the data slate, and plenty of top performances besides that. Their core army rules are for the greater good, for units working in pairs for a plus 1 ballistic skill buff, Often it's quite popular to use Tetras for that role, given that they give you some enormous hit roll re-rolls into the mix as well. And then their detachment rule is Cal Yon, some big sustained hits from turn 3 to 5, sustained hits too if they're guided, which you're usually going to be if you've got some very scary damage units. I say their stratagems are largely a bit more mediocre, the jump shoot jump one is really quite important for crisis bombs, and the early Cal Yon is perhaps the most interesting out of the enhancements. It seems to be fairly auto include with a cold star commander leading a big squad of cyclic ion blaster crisis suits, which just obliterate most targets that you throw them at. Otherwise I'd say that Tower in the position where most of the other units in their codex are really quite usable. Ghost kills are quite nice for not being able to be shot back, plus they've got other good lone operatives like Ornvar with his very big defensive stat line. For a bit of more dedicated anti-tank fire support, broadsides, hammerheads and sky rays are fairly powerful, and riptides are kind of nice just as a bit of a midfield disruption unit. Not quite as much firepower, but a lot better defence than much of the army. Shadow Sun's nice between lone operatives, character buffs and CP farming. Tetras seem to be near auto include for the big hit rerolls, and there's quite a lot of options for small and expendable units for objectives between Kroot, Hounds, Stealth Suits and Vespids, and even the regular infantry squads like Breachers and Fire Warrior Strike teams are playable. In general, perhaps their biggest weaknesses are still not really having that many units that really want to be on the front line on midfield objectives. Everyone knows that Tau don't really like being in combat, but they don't really have many units that are particularly tough for the cost either, and actually want to take punishment and can hold the points even with enemy firepower. Between that and Cal Yon, it might mean that they're racing to table the opponent and score loads of points in the later game, that they might have been a little bit behind for in the early game. Still seems to be coming together for them quite well though, definitely an army that can handle itself at the top levels of play. Otherwise, in a fairly similar position to the Tau Empire are the Leagues of Votan, arguably the weakest faction in Warhammer 40k before, and then just absolutely flipped to being a very strong faction. Games Workshop helped them out, both with big points cuts to just about their entire index, as well as turning their detachment rule from a lackluster one to a very good one, automatic judgement tokens to allow you to get plus one to hit and wound against the four biggest threats in your opponent's army, which is just a world of difference compared with just one of them. Since the data slate, they've won four big events, which is kind of impressive given they're still a lesser played faction being fairly new to the game, 17th most played overall in tournaments. Their core mechanic are the judgement tokens, which are arguably a little bit less important than they might have been previously. If you just automatically mark your opponent's biggest four units with them, then extra ones might have some slightly diminishing returns, though it certainly still doesn't hurt to have a Carl around, and your opponents will pick up some from killing units anyway. Ruthless Efficiency also gives you a command point reward when you kill any one of those four big enemy threats, and that does mean that they should have a fair few command points to throw around fairly early in the game. Their stratagems I think are actually genuinely quite good, several reasonably nice damage dealer ones, particularly the big one for the sustained hits. Otherwise the index is fairly limited in terms of unit numbers, though most of them are very playable. I still say that the Hearthkin Warriors are a little bit behind the power curve in general, Maybe the Chthonian Berserk's not a standout as some, but basically everything else does seem to be quite good. Sagittors make very big appearances in most lists. Hecaton Land Fortresses are really nice at just 225 points. The Iron Here Hearthguard and Graviton Thunderkin seem to be the best damage dealers out of the infantry units, usually backed up by characters, and most lists include at least some Hernkin Pioneers for some cheap fast movers. Depending on the list, they can still be a little bit slow and short ranged, but with a bunch of scout units and transports and vehicles perhaps being a big focus of the index right now, that's not really that much of an issue. They've definitely flipped back to being an army that's got a lot of raw power just by its very nature now. Finally, last but by no means least, we have the factions that are arguably the strongest factions by win rate in Warhammer 40k right now. Orcs on 54%, Black Templars on 55%, Chaos Marines also on 55%, but winning a vast amount of tournaments, and Eldari still reigning supreme on 57 I guess it's not entirely guaranteed that the armies will stay this way, but anything that's nosing around the 55% sort of level or higher is almost certainly going to attract some of Games Workshop's attention for balance updates. Eldari in particular do look like they're scheduled for some more nerfs, before they eventually get a bit more balanced against the rest of the mere mortal army lists out there. Putting them onto the big graph that rounds out the top factions in Warhammer 40k, overall there's definitely some things that are ahead or behind the pack, but so much less so than last time round. Digging into those top factions though, and a lot of people were fairly positive about the Orcs having a good chance to do well. Previously they were kind of middling at a 48% win rate before the data slate, now have gone up to more like 54. 
They've managed to take home four big event titles and are relatively popular to be played, eighth most popular at tournaments right now. Their army rule and points at the moment though do really kind of push them towards one style of play, being very melee rush heavy. The war rule gives them better defence and hit much much harder in combat, plus being able to advance and charge for a turn, absolutely enormous when it goes off. And the war tribe detachment only really doubles down on that with sustained hits for melee units, making them even more violent. Otherwise, for better stratagems out of the index, minus one to wound is rather nice. And overall, the units do feel a bit more resilient on the whole, given that they actually have 5 plus saves as opposed to 6 plus now. In 10th edition, with a bit more cover and a little bit less AP going around, it's a lot more common to actually have orcs getting armor saves off their base rules. As a result, all the orky competitive army lists at the moment tend to build around some big hitting melee violence. Knobs in a truck or battle wagon with a war boss in particular, beast snagger boys with a beast boss. Mega knobs are generally quite nice following the points cuts, and squig hog boys are fairly standout, perhaps in particular at least one squad guarding the knob with a smasher squig with Ed Whopper's kill chopper, as he's one of the few things that can just absolutely obliterate monsters or vehicles. Otherwise, for objective support, grots are pretty excellent OC for the cost and can do CP farming things and Stormboy units are pretty cheap to drop in, take points, and then move on. Squigasaur bosses and Mosrog Scragbad are pretty mighty all round. Trucks seem to be almost auto-include for how cheap they are to deliver melee into combat, and Captain Badrock and Flash Gits often make appearances, being some of the only competitive representation for shooty orcs at the moment. Overall, melee violence for the orcs does seem to be working out quite well for them. I feel like it would be a shame if it weren't one of the best ways to play them at least. I feel like it would be kind of nice though if things were a little bit more even between the other playstyles. Buggies, walkers and planes just generally seem to be a bit overcosted and not really run very regularly, nor are shooting orcs on foot. Otherwise, they perhaps can be a little bit predictable in generally wanting to melee rush you. Can be an issue for some of the armies that want to do a lot of sneaky trick things and have not so much toughness, maybe gene stealer cults or demons perhaps, but they can often have trouble against knight type lists with lots of very very tough stuff, a lot of their units are only so good against vehicles and monsters. Overall, generally things are looking pretty positive for the greenskins though. Next up, and seemingly putting out some pretty spectacular numbers over the past few weeks are the Black Templars. They were quite obviously going to be one of the strongest ways to play Space Marines after the updates, given the crazy points cuts to things like Primaris Crusader squads and regular ones, but it seems that currently they're sitting on a win rate around about 55%, a huge increase on last time. Though in general still remaining one of the lesser played armies in 40k overall, Dark Angels still seem to be taken more regularly than them. And even this mighty win rate only seems to have delivered them two big event wins since the data slate, though I'd definitely not be too surprised to see a few more in the future. Besides Oath of Moment, which will probably hurt them a bit, going down from no full wound rerolls, they get their Templar Vows, a choice of four boosts pre-game, where it's often just quite nice to go for the 6 plus feel no pain type one, though you could swap that out for one of the melee damage dealers if it works out better. Otherwise, within their detachment, a 4 plus chance to prevent fallback can be really big in the right situation, and he can get 5 plus feel no pains on two different squads, one with Grimaldus and one with the Tannhauser's Bones. As mentioned, both flavours of Crusader squad are just perhaps ridiculously cheap for how many models you get. 14 points for Primaris Crusaders, around 12 to 13 for the Firstborn flavour. You can put enough Marines on the table to kind of stat check your opponent against some lists if they can't deal with two wound bodies en masse. For a bit more quality, Sword Brethren are a very good melee unit that you can build around, particularly if you're using some of the other vows for them. And for other supporting things in the Codex, Helbrecht and Grimaldus are both standout good characters for their cost, each in their own way. And the Templar tanks are quite nice advantages over the standard Space Marine ones. Repulsors, Repulsor Executioners and Gladiators are all okay in their own right, but Templars get an extra multi-melter, often at a very small extra points cost. Overall, they do seem to be generally doing really quite well in-game. Maybe like the World Eaters, just a little bit predictable on what they're going to do, and the best players around might be able to manage the sheer might of them. I guess the Space Marine Codex update is going to represent a power cut for their core detachment. Basically, things will remain the same, but they'll lose the big wound rerolls that Oath and Moment had previously. I feel like a few of the detachments could be pretty interesting for them, maybe most notably the Vanguard Spearhead for them. You could have some seriously scary melee threats getting it infiltrate, and otherwise the rules seem quite nice for supporting durability and sneaky tricks for a bunch of infantry. Perhaps could be an interesting enough alternative, perhaps could be another interesting enough alternative along with Righteous Crusaders and Gladius. Finally though, and getting into the armies that are considered the top two factions in Warhammer 40k, 
And first up, we've got Chaos Space Marines, who may have the same win rate as the Black Templars on 55% at the moment, but seem to have the absolute potential to go to the absolute top of the tree when they're run by good players. They've got a pretty crazy 12 big event win since the balanced data slate came out, which is massively ahead of most. And while they're a popular faction, being the fifth most played at tournaments overall, even if you account for that, then their tournament wins are a massive overrepresentation of how many players they have, being pretty much at the same level as Eldari. Chaos Marines do seem to have come into their own since the balance update, having a lot of the armies that were stronger than them take some heavy nerfs, whereas they look like they've come out okay. Forge Fiends, Obliterators and Abaddon all went up, but their fairly powerful data sheets and perhaps Dark God tier supporting rules still seem to carry them to victory. Their core army rule are the Dark Packs to allow them to get sustained or lethal hits at the risk of taking some mortal wounds, and then that gets buffed further to be seriously quite dangerous damage buffs when you combine that with their Marks of Chaos. They allow certain damage boosts to get far beyond that, and also have some ridiculously powerful combinations with some of the great stratagems that they have access to, maybe notably the Nurgle one that prevents a unit getting shot at greater than 12 inches, which is just scarily powerful to have on really dangerous units, and the Chaos Undivided one that gives you spectacular damage hit rolls and wound rerolls just for one CP. There's plenty of more besides that, and they can also dip into the Chaos Knight or Demon Codex if it makes sense. Demons might often get used for some cheap distraction Nurglings to do secondary objectives and things, or perhaps do similar with some lone operatives. For standout units in their army list at the moment, chosen led by lords tend to be a staple. Really brutal damage output with undivided jumping out of rhinos or land raiders. I think that possessed with devastating wounds and a master of possession can still be pretty strong, though probably a little bit less so than chosen lords overall. Warp talons got very good with their huge points decrease in the last codex. You could use Slanesh to get them into combat at some extreme distances. Forge Fiends and Obliterators seem to be near auto-include, often marked with either Undivided or Nurgle, depending on which of those powerful stratagems that you want to access. They've got some enormous Dark Pact synergy, with either Abaddon or Hellbrute or both making Dark Pacts on firepower units just ridiculous. And there's plenty of other strong options in the book. Several of their other armor things are perfectly usable, particularly with Dark Pacts, and Accursed Cultists with Dark Communes are rather good annoying hordes to claim the middle of the board with, that regenerate if you can't kill them all. Overall, clearly with these sort of statistics, one of the strongest factions in Warhammer 40k. I feel like in particular one of the armies with the highest skill ceilings, when if you're coordinating the use of their powerful stratagems at the exact right time to most influence a game, you might well do better than the average player by quite a bit. Overall, definitely one of the armies to be most scared of right now. Finally, still retaining their crown as the rightful rulers of the galaxy, it would seem, are the Eldari, very much showing that the craft worlds aren't beaten yet, despite taking an enormous battery of nerfs both to their core mechanics and to just about every single one of their competitive units. With Games Workshop's battery of nerfs, Eldari have admittedly dropped around about 10% wins, dropping down from around about 67 to 57, though given that Games Workshop hit all the other big armies in a similar way, if not worse, the other rivals that would have been Custodes, Genes of the Colts and Knights are now far lower in the rankings, and it would seem that Eldari are still just about retaining their spot as the top army in 40k. As a result, they're still the most popular played faction at Grand Tournaments, they've won a crazy 16 events since the balanced data slate came out, and again like the Chaos Space Marines, even with accounting for the number of people playing Eldar, by these numbers at least they still seem to have the best ratio of event wins per number of people playing them, so basically by literally every single metric that I can see, they seem to be on top. Having said that though, at least it's far less so than before, at least now they're within 10% wins of the majority of factions of the game, whereas previously I think they were only within 10% wins of about 2 or 3 factions. As per previously, the Eldari still have an enormous amount of strong rules. Strands of Fate allow you to sub in some Miracle Dice type mechanics to certain key roles once per phase, and that can be made into a 6 by a nearby Farseer if desired. They've still got big access to automatic devastating wounds or automatic overwatch hits if they need it. And even if the devastating wounds can't splash to multiple models now, that can still be a really big deal. The detachment rule of re-rolling one hit roll and wound roll when you're attacking still makes their anti-tank weapons some of the best in 40k, Things like Hornets, Fire Prisms and War Walkers, all having some very fearsome anti-tank damage. Then their stratagems and enhancements have a lot of useful stuff. Fate's Messenger to get some automatic sixes for the unit is very popular. The Phoenix Gem is nice enough to resurrect a character. And their detachment has a whole bunch of movement type shenanigans, perhaps in particular Phantasm, which is still enormously powerful to reposition an infantry unit each turn. I feel like the Codex overall has a bit more internal balance than it did before, as most of the last nerfs fell fairly squarely on the stuff that was taking at tournaments the most, but the majority of the army seems very playable and still strong. The Farseers can still be linchpins with the automatic sixes and a minus one to wound from Fortune, Guardians can rustle up some more Fate dice, 
The Autark Wayleaper is still very popular as a lone operative and generates you some command points over the course of the game. Wraith Guards with Spirit Seers are still nice. There's some nice fast units for secondary objectives like Shadow Spectres and Warp Spiders. Maybe some Shroud Runners, Wind Riders or Swooping Hawks might help as well. The Incarn is still pretty monstrous for 350 points and Night Spinners were perhaps surprisingly not touched too hard. A little bit of fairly nasty Norse line of sight shooting. I think Illic Night Spear and Ranger Entourage still did quite well out of the updates, not really going up in points too much. Overall, they're still an enormously strong army, though certainly nowhere near as much as they used to be before. Looking at average win rates against other armies, things like Gene Stealer Colts and maybe Black Templars and things that rush them tend to do a bit better. And now at least their units tend to be a bit fragile if they do get caught. Things that can drop in close and just destroy things no question to ask can be quite nice. And a little bit of indirect fire can definitely punish their very expensive objective scoring infantry like Shadow Spectres or Warp Spiders. Overall still seems to be the army to beat though. I certainly guess that Games Workshop are probably going to hit them with some more nerfs when the next balance pass comes around. So perhaps this time I suspect they wouldn't need to be quite as brutal to get them a bit more in line with other factions in the game. A lot of units have already gone up in points to the extent where you don't have that much presence on the table, at least compared with some factions. Overall though, putting it all together, 10th edition does seem to be in a lot better state than it was previously. I guess with future balance passes, Games Workshop can focus on getting the last few factions a bit more in the middle, and perhaps helping out some of the armies in the middle with a bit more internal balance within their codexes, so there aren't quite as many auto-includes or never-take units. If you're interested, here's just the comparison to last time around. Maybe it doesn't look entirely different in terms of distribution, but to bear in mind that the scale's basically going up from around about 65% to around about 35%, Games Workshop definitely have narrowed their distribution by a fairly impressive amount. Finally, just because I was kind of interested, I thought it would be interesting to see the actual raw tournament event wins divided by the amount of player rate, just for a very rough and ready metric of how likely any given player running an army is to actually win an event. I'd bear in mind that this is going to be fairly random data given that there's just not really that many tournament winners out there. A lot of these factions only had one or zero event wins. Certainly one good performance could have affected the table massively. I think it perhaps really does back up quite well that Eldari and Chaos Marines are doing very well and are very overrepresented though, even despite being some of the most popular factions in the game. They still come out at the very top of this chart, really quite a big head higher than things like Leagues of Votan, Death Watch, Thousand Sons, Tau and Gene Stealer Colts, which are the next ones to follow. At least for actual big tournament wins, a few of the other high win rate factions like Orcs, Black Templars and Chaos Knights are significantly further down the table. Looks like overall, if you're a top player competing at the absolute pinnacle of 40k, then Eldari and Chaos Marines might well give you the best chance. Leagues of Votan, Tau and Thousand Sons also seem to be pretty good. And Death Watch and Gene Stealer Colts are also listed up there, but there's very little data on those given that they're played so infrequently. In any case, hope you've enjoyed the video. A quick wander through each faction in Warhammer 40k and roughly how well they seem to be doing in game at the moment. As always, feel free to share any other insights or experience that I might have missed here. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics, but I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming. I do tend to post new ones just about every day. And finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support and keep these big videos coming. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, an enormous thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.